The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has been given the near impossible task of following up one of the greatest games ever made, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. A game designed around seeing something in the distance and saying, wow, then riding, climbing, gliding, launching and falling your way over to it while being constantly distracted along the way. Ooh, a piece of candy. Ooh, a piece of candy. Ooh, a piece of candy. This gameplay loop results in one of the most liberating open world experiences I have ever played, set on a map that is nothing less than a masterclass in level design. I couldn't even imagine how this formula could have been taken any farther, but then Tears of the Kingdom comes along and makes Breath of the Wild feel like a prototype to what's likely the greatest sandbox ever made in video games. But the more I played Tears of the Kingdom, the more I started to realize that it wasn't giving me the same feeling that Breath of the Wild did. And I think Tears of the Kingdom's greatest feature may have come at the cost of what made the first game so special, and I am very conflicted to say the least. So I wanted to take some time and talk about it. I'm not here to review Tears of the Kingdom, I'm just here to give some of my thoughts and experiences on one of the greatest games I've ever played. So sit back, relax, and let a guy alone in his bedroom tell you about The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Across five years, two playthroughs, one of them being on Master Mode, I spent over 400 hours playing Breath of the Wild, exploring every corner of the map, completing the main game and all the DLC. It's my favorite game, causing me to get art on my wall and the collector's book, which comes with a little glass spirit orb. But even though I hold the game in such high regard, I can still acknowledge that the game wasn't perfect. The weapon durability system divided fans the most, with players either hating it or loving it. The inventory system could be super clunky, and it's most apparent when you're cooking something and you're scrolling through your inventory trying to find all the items, and then you find them all, and then you miss the cooking pot just for you to then pick them all up off the floor and then do it again. These things and others sucked, but despite its flaws, exploring Breath of the Wild was incredible. It is one of the most beautiful games I have ever played, from its visuals to its music. And no game for me has been able to recreate the genuine sense of getting lost in a world where you're so excited to find out what's around every corner. Until I played Elden Ring, which pretty much nailed it, but that's a totally different conversation. So surprising nobody, I was very excited one night, alone, in the dark, illuminated by the light of my screen, watching a Nintendo Direct when they ended the show on One More Thing. This teaser officially kicked off the four-year hype train where Nintendo little by little gave us more information on the true scope of the game. But despite what the trailers were showing, none of us could have ever anticipated what we were about to be able to do with these creative tools. Fuse allows us to combine any two items to make our own weapons, like putting a cannon on a shield, a flamethrower on your sword, or putting an electric eyeball on your arrow to track down an enemy. Recall is allowing us to reverse time on all the objects around us, Ascend is letting us go through any ceiling above us, and Ultra Hand lets you build any vehicle your mind can imagine, from cars, to planes, to boats, to whatever the fuck this thing is. And what do you think the internet does as soon as they get their hands on these tools? They make giant stick figures with flamethrower dicks and Korok rotisserie machines. With great power comes great responsibility. Okay, in fairness, that's just what they did in the first few days, but if you go on now, you're gonna see so many insane builds coming out of this game. I'm seeing mechs of all shapes and sizes. I'm watching people recreate Star Wars vehicles like pod racers, X-Wings, and TIE Fighters that let you go in first person. I'm seeing mono wheels, tanks, multi-stage rockets, three axes, gimbals, spinning death machines. I can keep going, but there is so many insane things coming out of this game. It took me tens of hours for me to even realize the capabilities of the tools in my hands. In the tutorial, the most I use Ultra Hand for was putting fans on the back of minecarts and building longer and longer bridges out of logs. But then one day, I was building a vehicle and I dropped it. And I was like, oh, maybe I could, oh. And then I grabbed it out of the air with Ultra Hand. And I was like, oh my God, it clicked. I can take all these tools around me and I can combine them together. And then all sorts of things started to click for me. I could take platforms and then move them around and then use reverse time on it to make my own custom elevators. I could just build contraptions specifically to help me use Ascend to get to ceilings I can't reach. It is not an understatement for me to say that these are some of the most impressive creative mechanics I have ever seen in a video game. We've seen building your own weapons and building your own vehicles before, but that's typically found in sandbox first games like Kerbal Space Program or Gary's Mod. So when you think about it in the context of an open world with the story, combat, dungeons, and puzzles, it is a true testament to the master craftsman at Nintendo that this game can hold any semblance of narrative and level structure and not just crumble under the weight of its own possibilities. But for better or worse, the game also doubles down on many of the core features that were in Breath of the Wild. The combat system makes a return and functions in the exact same way, not including all the enhancements from Fuse and Ultra Hand. Weapon durability is back without any noticeable changes. The inventory has been given some small quality life updates like a quick access menu and now you don't have to close the chest or reopen it every 
every time your inventory is full. A lot of people just drop the first game entirely because they were just bored or overwhelmed as soon as they left the tutorial area. And Tears of the Kingdom functions the exact same way. To the point where, for example, when you get to the first town, there's a quest line you can start that unlocks many of the core abilities for your main piece of equipment. You could leave the town, never to return, play the whole game, and never even realize you're missing these abilities. I can see why that's annoying and it can turn a lot of people off, but at the same time, this is why I find the game so amazing. It creates these stories that you then get to go tell your friends where you're like, oh, I did this thing and I found this other thing after, and then your friend's like, oh, I didn't do that thing, but I went over here and I found that thing, and yada, 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 yada. Because odds are your friends are on a completely different path than you are, and it creates these stories to tell each other versus just being like, hey, bro, how far are you in the game? This all means if you like the first game, you're going to love the sequel, and if you didn't like the first game, you're probably not going to like this one either. And the same could be said about the story in this game. Just like the first game, the story is told through flashbacks, text boxes, and short cutscenes. By the nature of the game's design not pushing you in any direction and letting you do what you want to do, it does take away from all the urgency to any of the stakes in the story. It's incredibly hard to push a story forward and let a player do whatever they want to do. And I don't think I can ask for more outside of what Nintendo's already done to balance between the two. With that said, Tears of the Kingdom's story is way more compelling than Breath of the Wild. Each area that the main story takes you to feels much more impacted by the events that are taking place. And after completing each area, your actions have a very visible effect on the landscape. The game also does a much better job of immersing you because it has you traveling with companions and fighting alongside groups of NPCs. Just these few things did a lot for attaching me to the world where the last game made me feel much more disconnected. There's also multiple moments in the story that are just gorgeous or really fun to play and just like had me going, but I understand this won't be for everybody. But we don't play these games for the story. We play these games to explore the world and play in the sandbox. And this brings us to the part where I feel the most conflicted. In Breath of the Wild, traversing the environment required a different strategy depending on where you were. Each region subtly encouraged and limited certain modes of travel. When you're in Hyrule Field, your horse is the fastest way to get around because it limits your paraglider with nothing to jump off of. But then you get to the Elden region and you can't bring in your horse, so now running and paragliding is the fastest way to get around. Once you get into the desert, now you can't jump off of anything and you can't bring your horse in, so shield surfing becomes the fastest way to get around. The game carefully balances what you can and can't do in each environment to keep the gameplay fresh. The game ensured that no single form of movement would dominate in all scenarios. By tastefully limiting the methods of travel, it forced you to engage with each environment's challenges uniquely, and then it created a variety of gameplay experiences throughout the game. But Tears of the Kingdom works a little differently. I haven't been the most creative when it came to building vehicles so far. Most of the time, my vehicles are just consisting of a few parts, or I'm just using whatever the game's prompted me to use in front of me. And after I saw this thing, it became my go-to vehicle in most situations. But I enjoyed making boats to travel around the coast, or making cars to go up mountains or go off-roading. It just kept the game fresh, changing up what vehicles I was getting around in. But it quickly became apparent to me that 9 out of 10 times, the fastest way to get around was flying. And the game doesn't really make it that hard to do. Let me explain where I'm going with this by giving you a few experiences I had. I first started having these thoughts when the game asked me to climb Death Mountain. I get to the base of the mountain, and my first instinct is to build a little flying machine to start going up the side. It takes me about 20 seconds to get halfway up the mountain, and I realize that there's a minecart track that's snaking around the mountain that takes you up. I think to myself, okay, well, that might be cool, so I hop back to the bottom, get on the track, and it starts this whole five-minute sequence where I'm riding up and using my new sage power to fight off enemies that are fighting me on the track. I thought to myself, wow, that was pretty sick. I'm really glad I did that. But then I get there, and I'm like, oh... Is there other times that I might have missed something like that? I then find myself in the Fire Temple, and the Fire Temple has this really impressive minecart system in it. The dungeon has you solving puzzles to get higher and higher up the track, and it took me about 30 minutes to get halfway, and I got a little stuck. I'm sitting there for about 10 minutes or so, weighing through my options, trying to figure out what to do, and then I realize, oh, I can just build a flying machine and skip over the entire minecart track. I build one real quick and I hop in and it takes me only 15 minutes from that point forward to finish the entire rest of the dungeon, including the boss fight. Then later I'm in the desert traveling through the sandstorm. It's supposed to be this part of the game where your map doesn't work and you're stumbling through the storm trying to find your way. They put these little gusts of wind throughout the whole thing so then you can peek up and then see where you're at and get a sense of direction and then go back in and get lost again. As I was traveling through the storm, the whole time I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, I want to experience this. this is a unique part of the game. I want to see what the developers have made. This is pretty cool, but I also know at any point I could just build a flying machine and skip this entire thing and it would be faster. I decided, you know what? I'm just going to make a little sand sled and zoom around. I get to the part where I need to find the sand temple. I'm zooming around on my sand sled and I'm about a third of the way in the puzzle. I see something out in the distance. I think that's where I need to go. So I head that way and I got lost. I'm thinking to myself, oh, this could be this whole cool experience where I'm lost in the sandstorm, trying to find my way back. You know, kind of the whole point of 
the sandstorm. You need to peek over, get your bearings, get back in, you know? But I'm like, fuck this, it's taking too long. I build a flying machine, I get above the storm, and it takes me three minutes to finish the rest of the puzzle. So this is where I'm conflicted. I understand what makes Tears of the Kingdom amazing is its ability to allow you to approach any of these scenarios in any way you want. And as I said earlier, these are some of the most impressive creative tools I have ever seen in a video game. I felt like these tools really hit their stride for me while I was in the shrines. Most of these shrines are just giving me a bunch of Lego pieces and letting me figure out however I wanted to finish the shrine. And it was always super satisfying for me to find these solutions in my own way and I enjoyed it way more than I did in Breath of the Wild. And I really liked the way these tools work for the open world puzzles. Like when you have to make the stands for the Hudson Construction Company, or every time you have to get the stable trotters to the ferries by making a vehicle out of their carriage. It was really satisfying for all these puzzles and the shrines when your answer was the right answer and it obviously wasn't the intended answer. And I feel like this is a lot of the charm of the game, where you feel like you're cheating in a lot of these puzzles and the game's just letting you do it and it works. And in that context, cheating is fine. But the thing is, I don't want to feel like I'm cheating myself out of an experience in the open world. In Breath of the Wild, I loved coming across all these different handcrafted experiences. They forced me to change my play style and offer different gameplay opportunities throughout the whole game. The game would put these creative restraints on me, and then the path of least resistance would often force me to try something new. But in Tears of the Kingdom, a game of far less restraints, way too often the path of least resistance was the same thing flying over it. The game asks you to build vehicles all the time, and every time I decided not to build a flying machine, it felt like I was intentionally making the game harder on myself instead of actually being put into a scenario that requires a different approach. With all that being said, I still love this game. I still took the boat rides, drove off road, and rode my shield in all the appropriate places. And every time I decided to take one of these approaches, I really felt the magic that this game was trying to give by giving us so many other ways to explore the world. And I haven't even mentioned how amazing the depths in the Sky Islands were to explore. And it's really worth noting that I didn't feel the same way exploring these two areas as I did on the base map. And it has to be because these two areas were built with these new tools in mind. While the base map, besides for a few tweaks here and there, definitely wasn't designed with the same intentions. I don't think in any way that the experiences I've had with the game take away from how amazing this game is and how incredible these mechanics are. I just really wish I didn't have such an easy way to skip so much of this great content that the developers have made for me to experience. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is a true achievement. Very few games have ever gotten me this excited about games as a medium. The level of creative expression that this game gives players to explore one of the best made open worlds is unheard of. And I don't think we're going to be able to see any game do anything like this for years if not a decade to come. In a gaming landscape where we've become so accustomed to buggy and unfinished AAA releases, it feels like a true miracle that a game of this quality and this scope is releasing on a Nintendo Switch. The distance that Nintendo has put themselves ahead of the competition can only be met by very few players in the industry. Only true masters of their craft could have ever pulled off a game like this, and I think everybody owes it to themselves to go out of their way and try what's my new favorite game, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Well, if you're still here, thank you so much for watching. This video took me a few weeks to put together. I've never done something like this before, but it was a lot of fun doing. If you liked the video, please leave a like. If you want to see more, consider subscribing. If you agreed or if you disagreed with what I had to say, please leave a comment down below. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Bye.